Morning, everybody. Very nice to see everybody on this supernova morning. Supernova, a cliff tea following wondrous. What can be wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. So last week, and I hope you have your notes from last week so you make some comparisons with this week, I gave you a list of what you were going to leave with today in terms of new information. And I made this wild claim that I would be using long words, we'd be talking science today, and all of these things that I have so much fun doing. Then, as I thought about it during the week, I thought, oh my God, I still haven't given you full context for Cliff Teats. So, we're going to rearrange the schedule slightly. I'm going to move the science to next week, and I'm going to bring the context. And I'm really talking about historical context into this week, and we'll focus on that. So by the end of today's session, you'll have more of an understanding of Cliff T's overall from a historical standpoint. In addition, you'll have a preliminary understanding of the naming conventions of teas in the Wui Mountains. Because it's a darn mess. And it's really, really hard for first timers and people who aren't really deep in the lore to understand what all this naming convention is. As usual though, we're gonna start with shop news. And what should happen yesterday, but the best and most interesting piece of shop news related to Cliff Teats. So yesterday, this older gentleman, late 60s, early 70s, Chinese, comes rolling in and I'm trying to figure out, and he has a disciple with him. At first, I didn't understand it was a disciple because I spoke to the older gentleman and he's asking a few questions and he's looking around. And then he says, I like Cliff Tees. Do you know what Cliff Tees are? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, this many times is a trick question. And so I treated it very carefully because I didn't want to fall off a cliff, so to speak. And I used the Chinese. I said, Yan Cha. And he says, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And he says, oh, by the way, you speak Chinese. I said, not very well, but yeah, I can get by. And so we started talking about 50s. And of course, we've got this huge number here. And he was immediately blown away. So why does this gentleman know anything about 50s? Because he's gone to the Wui Mountains several times. And he understands really good cliff tea. And he said, you know, I've traveled all over California and looking for shops that have great cliff tea because I know what it is since I've been there. I said, that's fine. We'll give you great cliff tea. And then he asked me a few more questions. I knew that these questions were trying to determine really what knowledge we had here. And as every question was answered to his satisfaction, he became really excited about trying. So we gave both he and his disciple, and this disciple truly is a disciple, traveling around with him, trying to learn and understand tea, because this gentleman apparently understands tea quite well. And certainly when we talked in detail about the Wui Mountains, he truly understood it. We ta started talking about white tea, he truly understood that as well. So at least his history with Fujian province is outstanding. So why didn't he argue with us when we served it in a super science cup? Because he was open to trying anything. And when they tried the large size, they said, oh my gosh, you guys have killed it. He said, we've been everywhere and we haven't had anything like this. 
And they named off all the tea shops in California they've been to, and they've been to a lot of places. So this further perplexed us because we said, well, how did you find this one? And he said, another tea shop owner recommended this. Another tea shop owner from Chinatown who actually happens to have been here. And he said, this is the only place that you're going to get what you're looking for. So they spent about an hour and a half, couple hours here talking with customers, talking with us, talking with themselves and try and taking pictures of everything because they just hadn't seen another p a place like this in California. Yes. Which tea did you serve? Ah, great question. So the two teas we served them were Unicorn and Guardian Angel. And they ended up buying a considerable amount of Guardian Angel. And with a further promise, they'll be back. And I'm sure they will. All right. So that was the interesting thing from a cliff tea perspective that occurred this week and from a shop perspective. Let's jump in with historical context for you because cliff teas as well as smoky pine, and I'll get to that in a minute, represent the earliest forays into Europe in terms of tea that they enjoyed, that they really enjoyed. It also was tea that was being exported very early. So how early is very early? Well, there's historical records that between 483 and 493, tea was exported to Turkish traders. So they took it to Turkey. As far as anybody knows, it never got beyond Turkey. So that's the earliest. In 593, there's records of tea being exported to Japan along with Buddhism. So that was the earliest that it, as far as anybody knows, or, or historic records knows, that that was the earliest that it went to Japan. So we got Japan and Turkey covered and all the places in between. Well, wait a minute, there aren't very many places in between. There are the Stans, Kazakhstan, and all the other stars between China and Turkey. So those places probably experienced tea, but Europe wasn't experiencing tea. So when was the earliest that Europe began to experience tea? So sometime in the very late 1500s, the Dutch, uh, that's incorrect, the Portuguese, and actually, I can give you an exact date. In 1557, the Portuguese took Macau for themselves. And Macau is in southern China. And obviously, Chinese there were drinking tea. So the Portuguese started to have access to tea. Did they understand anything about tea? No, it was good. But they didn't really understand anything about it. They tried to take a little bit back to Europe, but why did that fail? It failed because the technology was not up to snuff. So what do I mean by that? What technology? Shipping technology, <coughs> packaging technology. Remember, what is the main enemy of exporting tea? Moisture. If you can't get the tea, in an airtight situation, it's really hard to take it far away places. Even in China, let's think about this for a minute. Between Wuyi Mountains and Shanghai, and by the way, nobody was getting tea in Shanghai at that time, but I'm using Shanghai as an example because on the map, it looks pretty close. By land, 24, 25, 26 days to get it to Shanghai. Now, if you happen to get it on a ship in the 1500s, how long did it take to get to Europe? 
the answer is forever. And moisture and forever don't mix. So that's why tea really didn't start going to Europe until the late 1500s, early 1600s. Who basically started this export practice and was it very successful in the beginning? It was the Dutch, because they had Indonesia, they came into port in China, in Macau actually, I should say, picked up tea and got some back to Europe. But it wasn't hugely popular in Europe yet. And by the way, when you ask me the obvious question, I will answer with the word green because it wasn't red tea that was initially going back to Europe. It was green tea. So the British, when they first started drinking tea, everybody assumes red tea, milk, sugar, scones, and all that stuff that makes British tea what it is. The answer would be no. They had green tea. But this was a revolution in Britain. Why? Because kids had two choices, morning choices. Uh, they probably had three choices of what to consume in terms of a beverage before they went to school, if they went to school. So what were those choices? Polluted water. Oh my gosh, that doesn't sound good. The rich kids could occasionally get milk. No, that sounds okay. And what about the rest of us? Alcohol. So those were the three choices that kids had. So when tea came to Britain, all of a sudden, mothers were very happy. You know what? The heck with this polluted water. We don't have the money for milk, but we sure have money for tea. And so that is one of the major beverages that began to be popular in Europe. And what did it do for the education level? Well, let's let me think. Maybe catechins have some relationship to brain power. Oh no, it's simpler than that. When you boil water to make tea, what happens to the germs and the noxious things in the water? They usually go away. Therefore, the general health of the population, the tea drinking population, of course, improve. So this gives you a little bit of a picture and context. And again, we're going back to Wu Li because starting in the early 1600s, and let's put some dates to this. So the first time red tea really was exported was probably around 1610, 1611, and 1612. Was it a lot? No. And which red tea was it first? Was it some of those wonderful cliff teas? Now, this is kind of a trick question because actually the way I, I asked it, you can answer yes, and it wouldn't be a bad problem. If I had said, was it these wonderful rule on cliff teas? The answer should be no, because they weren't really fully producing those yet. They were in process, but it was really the smoky pine, which was first going out because Europeans had a, tape, had a hankering for that. And while that wasn't popular in China, this was becoming popular among the Europeans. So I need to up your game in terms of language here for a moment. So we say Wu Yi Mountains. When the boxes arrived in Britain in the 1600s, did they say Wu Yi Mountains on them? Answer is no. They said Bohia, B O H E A. That is the Southern Fujian dialectical way of referring to the Wu Yi Mountains. 
So for you historians, when you look and there's reference to Bohia tea, that's really wheat tea. And Bohia implied something a little bit more. But wait a minute, I got get I have to get one more language piece in place. So frequently on the boxes, you would see Tsungo, C-O-N-G-O-U. Now, Chinese has, again, all these dialects. And what does Tsungo refer to? Kung Fu. So master class, highest level. So we love seeing Tsungo on any boxes. You don't see that, by the way, today. But at that time, people who knew anything, oh, Tungo, ah, master class, really good stuff. All right, so as more and more Wu Ti left the Wu Mountains, there were two ways, basically, that it started to get to Europe. One was a Southern route and one was a Northern route. So before we describe these roots, let's first see what made Wu Ti popular in China. And of course, I said it the wrong way. We should have said who made it popular. Well, let's talk about the royal family. Hey, eh? a Charles made it popular. Oh no, not the present Charles, Charles II. Why? because he married a princess from Portugal, Princess Catherine. And you know what her dowry gift was? It was tea wear. And what did she promote after she became queen? She promoted, after the marriage ceremony, drinking tea. And so this became very popular in the British Isles. So this didn't arise just because of mothers, it arose because of royal tradition. And of course, when you're royalty, you can make it real good. Uh, you have snacks with it. Also, you probably get the best stuff. You don't get the slob, but that's okay. Population saw royalty doing this. Royalty was promoting it. So within British society, this became very popular and it was red tea that became very popular. So this was from 1662 forward. All right, so let's talk about these roots, routes. Okay, now I'll try and keep it short here because I feel thirstiness arising and I have a bunch of activity at the shop which is showing me thirsty. So the Northern route, the Vui Mountain basically in the early days, tried to get to Fuzhou, which is in the center, but linked to the ocean, uh, Fujian province, took a boat up to Tianjin, which is Northern China. And if you look on a map and find Beijing, look to the right to the ocean and then slightly south, Tianjin, T-I-A-N-J-I-N-G, then overland through Beijing, Zhangjiakou, and up to Ulaanbaatar. Oh, wait a minute, where's Ulaanbaatar? Let me think about that. That sounds pretty Mongolian to me. Oh, how about that being the capital of Mongolia? And from Mongolia, it made its way to Northern Mo Mongolia, and from Northern Mongolia found Moscow from Moscow, the Russian traders. And by the way, it wasn't in Mos Moscow that the Russian traders took charge. They took charge at the border of Mongolia and then got it to Moscow, from Moscow to St. Petersburg, and then dispersed out into Europe. That was one route. The Southern route was to Fuzhou and then to Guangzhou and then to the Southeast Asian countries. Thailand, Laos, and actually Laos probably wasn't getting much tea. In fact, I'm sure they weren't because they were getting it 
across the border since they ported. So not much was by sea to Laos, but a lot to Thailand, a lot to Malaysia, a lot to Singapore. And then through the Straits of Malacca, the Straits of Malacca, where in the world am I? I am between the island of Malaysia where Kuala Lumpur is, that's the capital of Malaysia, and Sumatra, which is one of the islands of Indonesia. There's a little piece of water between those two. You sail through those waters and then you go due north and you head into the Middle East and from there to Europe. So those were the two routes. All right. Now the team master has signaled about 10,000 times that it's time to start drinking this wonderful stuff. And I'm thirsty myself. So it gives me great pleasure to bring forth Supernova via the team master. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. Everyone is here. Yeah, Good morning. Here. Hey, good morning. Ni hao. Zao sang hao, Irene. Yeah, I know you. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. So we do yan cha, wu yi yan cha, ha, it's oolong, ha, clean tea. So, eh, uh, this is my simulator, ha, huh? this is my space. I like this uh, style, you know, that's really good for me. This is stone, ha. Huh? So, yeah, you can see, ha, I just told me I. So this is the tableau be, yeah. working off of a tray. She's going to use a clay, Ishin clay pot to brew it. Has one cup. You're not dissipating the steam with Cliff Teas. So therefore, you don't need a bunch of cups. You don't need a bunch of other equipment. We've got tea toys here, including a lychee. And uh, this tray has a canal yeah. to drain the water. Yes, so you can see me how huh? maybe you don't have it's okay, but uh, maybe you have a wheelchair. Huh? So, I what do I do? Huh? This is my style, you know, the in Fujian, right? Yeah, if you like it, you copy. So, what that's called is to open up the pot. So, what does it mean to open up the pot? Looks plenty open to me. It really refers, and I'm using a Chinese translation. I'm translating it, but it really means heating up the pot. They don't call it that. They actually say kai, which starting out the pot, opening the pot, those are all possible translations. So how does this help you? It helps you because if you want the best Cliff tea. You're going to use the hottest pot possible. Now, for those of you who want to make a jump in logic, you may be thinking, hottest pot possible. Why don't I go to the big island of Hawaii and get a piece of lava and heat up the water until it is just steaming hot? Would that be a good thing? And the answer is no. The hottest pot possible closest to, to 200 degrees. We don't want 212. We don't want 205. We want 200 for as long as the pot can hold the 200. All right, she's putting the tea leaves in. That's five grams. It's pre-measured. When you do it, you don't have to measure. She's going to shake the pot, warm, uh, opening up the leaves. She smells, not really put supernova. Uh, she concludes she did. And then she draws the 200 degree water. So this structural way of pouring is the same as if you were doing Wunfu tea. In China, even though they'd be using smaller vessels, it's the same structural thought about how to do this tea. Uh, Negus, you do. Yeah. 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 Yeah
they found it in the top. And so you see what she's doing. She's heating. She's actually pouring the 200 degree water in. Timer is set for three minutes. And when she pours it in, she doesn't pour directly on the leaves. She pours, if possible, to the side. Under no circumstances do leaves like direct water to hit them. It doesn't matter what type of tea you are brewing. However, if you do happen to hit them, it doesn't matter. By doesn't matter, what I mean is don't stress out about it. It's not going to ruin the tea. Remember, we're perfectionists here. We want to get the maximal flavor that we can get. So all these things we tell you are small details related to the best flavor possible. But is a drop of water on a lonely tea leaf going to destroy the flavor? The answer is no. You won't even notice it. We notice when the details aren't done together. That we notice, and we it's a flavor difference. All right. If I may interject that, yeah. so bohea, B-O-H-E-A, right? Yes. So it's super interesting. When you Google bohea, yeah. you find in trees and tea companies saying it's pronounced bohe and that it's describing it as, la, as Suchang or Lapsan, Bohia, uh, originating in trade to British and Dutch East India Company. You see people calling it black tea with hints of smoke and flavor, and all sorts of interesting things that are uh, very different from what you shared with us. So I just, it's interesting, another example, just different information. A few entries down, you do find they find somebody who has a tea blog of some kind who starts, who actually is sharing the same historical, some of the same historical information that you shared. So I love the fact that you pulled this up and it pointed it out because so much of the information on the internet, although we know the intent is to tell the truth and to be very accurate, and probably 99% of what's on the internet is very accurate. Somehow in the tea world, you know, that more accurate gets buried way the heck down there as this entry shows. So what I just told you is accurate. And that's how you should understand Bohia. And by the way, the one thing that I won't argue with is the pronunciation. I say Bohia so that you can all sound it out and then write it. I don't know in Southern Fujian dialect how they really pronounce it. And I really don't think we should stress out about that. And that's why I do that. All right, timer has gone off. That was three minutes. Thank you though for that observation, appreciate it. Tea Master empties the recipient cup which she had heated with 200 degree water. Slowly on the sides, pours in supernova. You know, she's not trying to make bubbles. It isn't in an arc. She's not using a champagne glass. There's nothing fancy about this. We're trying to get the tea liquor into the cup successfully without creating bubbles, having this very beautiful color. By the way, when you do it, you should end up having this very beautiful color. Participant says the dry leaf smell of cocoa, dark chocolate with patches of varying degree of sweetness or touches, I should say, of varying degrees of sweetness, maybe dried fruit, melon. But that's on the dry leaves. Okay, love this opening comment about the dry leaves because there are hints of cocoa. I, I detect that. There are hints of a sweetness uh, in the aroma. And I also accept the dry fruit comment because that sweetness linked to dry fruit, there is a linkage there. And this tea has so many things going on with it. So 
to help you all here. Remember the naming, and we are going to talk about naming conventions. I haven't forgotten that. The naming, our naming convention here is related to all these things that you're talking about. Supernova, an explosion of something. Well, I think we're already starting to get that. All right, so 200 degree, this is a 200 degree snip, which means we don't stick our nose in there because we'll damage our nasal passage. But we do want to see what this is like. We not only want to see what it's like, we want to smell what it's like. So it's very hot, be very careful when it's your turn. All right, so I've got a baseline aroma. I'm looking at this color, very beautiful color. It's transparent. And now we're gonna enter the quality arena. So what are we looking for in the quality arena? We're looking for mouthfeel, astringency or lack thereof, density or thinness, viscosity. We're also looking for aftertaste. And then lastly, we're looking for energetics. So the first couple sips are about that. Subsequent sips expand and talk to you about the flavor, the actual aroma of the tea versus the tea leaves. We're collecting all of this information. All right. And remembering that this is a 200 degree sip. So this means we have to use care. We don't want to have an accident with this. Okay. I've smelled the tea liquor as I've smelled the leaves. Wow. And let's take our 200 degree sip. It's an inhalation. Remember, we're not blowing. We're not waving our hand over this. Okay. So I'm getting an impression now of mouthfeel and astringency and the other things I'm looking for. I'm gonna take a second sip here or inhalation, I should say. And I let it really pleasantly roll over my tongue. Why do I do that? Your taste buds cover your tongue. Every one of us has a different density of taste buds and the location of where things are tasted is different in everybody's tongue. Now, that sounds like, oh, I've got a lobster location, I have a prime rib location. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the inherent flavors are tasted in different parts of the tongue. And this is why we need to pay attention and be in the tea rhythm to fully understand this tea. Now I'm gonna take yet another inhalation and think about flavor. Okay, I've taken some mental notes. I'm thinking right now about the energetics and all of you don't feel shy because energetics are different by each person. And some people don't pick up energetics. Okay, not an issue, nothing wrong with you. So without further ado, let's have you brew along with the tea master. And so first step obviously is to make sure your pot is completely clean and devoid of any previous usages. In other words, no leftover tea in there. Tea master is checking very carefully. She's drying 200 degree water. You should have your timer set for three minutes.
you're heating up your Yixing pot or ceramic pot, whatever you have. Remember the rules, and I sent them out in the email, are different by type of vessel. I should say by different material of vessel. If it's Yixing clay, it's one set of rules. If it is ceramic, it's another set of rules. And those of you who have the special ceramic, I'm sorry, Yixing pots, generally speaking, the rules will be one less gram. But don't worry if you didn't think about that and you're using that pot. Just go ahead and follow these because the result won't end up bad at all. It'll still be a great result. Put the tea leaves in. You're going to shake them up to wake them up. You're going to smell. Did they really include supernova? Yeah, it smells like supernova. And then you're going to get your 200 degree water. And you're going to put it in the Yixing or the ceramic pot. And remember, as you put it in, you want ideally not to hit the leaves as much as possible. But don't worry again, this isn't something that you should stress about. Just one of those details. And you pour the remaining water over the pot. You also make sure your cup is heated and you set your timer. All right. So we were talking about Wui Mountain Tea, and the Wui Mountain Tea actually was the main driver. Now, this is my estimation. This isn't some historical figure I'm quoting. It was the main driver of the war between the opium wars uh, between China and Great Britain or the European powers. Why do I say it that way? Because the European powers weren't thirsting after Dragon Well. I don't even think they really knew Dragon Well existed. Dragon Well is a very, very great tea. There are other very, very great teas in China. But as far as the European palate and as far as the European population were concerned, hey, there's nothing better than the red tea. Bring me the red tea. Of course, they call it black. And so since the bulk of it in the beginning was coming from the Wuyi Mountains, that was the center of controversy. Well, why was it the center of controversy? Because China at one time said, okay, you foreigners, you only can land in Canton province. You can't, and only at the port we assign in Canton province. You can't land in Fuzhou. You can't land in Shanghai. We don't want to see any of your folks anywhere else. And so the foreigners were frustrated. Why? Because they were mainly there to get tea and silks, but mostly tea. And they were buying it in huge quantities. So if you're trying to move 10,000 pounds of tea on foot, from the Wuyi Mountains down to Canton province. That's a long trek. And it requires many people. And you go through many different terrars and climate changes. It's hard. And so the Europeans were saying, hey, what goes here? Why can't I just bring my boat up to Fuzhou? We'll spend the four or five days getting down to Fuzhou. And actually, there's a river from close to a canal, not close to, in the Wuyi Mountains that gave you access to Fuzhou. So, so much cheaper, so much faster. Why can't I do that? And eventually, they started trying to sneak in and do that. Now, the Chinese, oh, there's the timer.
And so what you're going to do is separate the leaves of the tea liquor. You're going to pour it into the cup, the heated cup. And remember, there's nothing dramatic about this. You're not, this isn't a food network thing where you're doing all sorts of fancy things so you can become famous. No, this is the right way to do it. And it conforms to the gunfu way of doing tea in a small cup. And it, the gunfu way was developed over years. So it's not an accident that we follow this methodology. This is the right way to do it. What does right way mean? I'm glad you asked that. Right way means you get the best flavor. There's no Bible for how to do in quotes the right way, but there is a best acknowledged flavor. So that's when I use the word right way, I don't mean the Sophie's way. I don't mean anything except what we've found to be the best flavor. Yes. Another participant also chimes in that he smells chocolate in warm rooms. Ah, so there, uh, one of the, one of you has noted the chocolate in the warm leaves, the chocolate in the warm leaves. And it's definitely there. It's a really pleasant, easy to smell tea. And again, I, I urge you all to be careful because if you smell too closely, you're going to burn your nasal passage. Not a good thing to do. So take your time. And while you take your time, I'll talk a little bit more about the we, this idea that the we teas really led to the opium wars. And the whole sense of this is that eventually the Chinese relented at some point, and for a while that boats come to Fuzhou and then took that privilege away again. And by the way, when they took the privilege away, they wrote these directives. And the directive was, okay, foreigners, only in Canton province. If I see your foreign face in somewhere else, there's gonna be punishment. And oh, by the way, you provincial governors who are supposed to be governing this, if I hear that you're allowing foreign faces in your area, you know, you're all done. Another uh, participant says that they love the smooth and pronounced minerality of this tea. Great comment. Smooth and pronounced minerality. Now, last week, nobody brought up when we were doing wondrous minerality until so far down the path of tasting that, wow, you've already identified a clear difference right away. The aroma of the tea liquor is sweet caramel with hints of cherry and raisin. Sweet caramel, hints of cherry and raisin for the aroma. Love the fact, again, that you're, you're getting that sweetness, you're getting the burnt sugar uh, aroma, and I absolutely get that. And then along with that, you're detecting other things which imply a sweetness and a slight fruitiness. And by the way, if you don't smell burnt cherries or, or cherries, but instead smell, oh, well, I smell apricots, that's fine. You're all in the same universe. On the wet leaves, another taster is perceiving yeastiness or umami and then the tea liquor has, again, the hints of caramel and maybe warm apple cider, a dense and smooth minerality. So umami to a hint of caramel and warm apple cider with a density. Love the concluding part of this, the density. This is hugely impactful on the mouth. And as it goes down the throat, it's almost suggestive of, wow, I'm almost eating something. It's that dense. I love the opening comment 
about the umami that's in these leaves. So all of you picked up right away on the hints of cocoa, but it took a minute as the smell fully developed for that vegetal or the umami ness to come through. And it's there. And great catch on that. What was the middle part of that? Uh, the hints of caramel, but with this warm apple cider. Oh, as warm well. apple cider. That's right. That's the one I wanted to capture. Yes, definitely hints of caramel, the warm apple cider. Why do I absolutely like that? Because the warm apple cider to me, that comment implies a slight hint of spice to this. So there's, there's so many things going on in this tea and you're capturing elements of them depending where you are in the cycle of the cooling of the tea and your ability to taste. Great job. So this gives you some context for how important the Wui Mountain Tea was to the whole history of Europe and China, because the Europeans fell in love with it. And this led to bad behavior on the Europeans part because you had, okay, what can we swap for this? Well, we're going to force the Chinese to do opium and we're going to get tea so that our balance of trade you know, is in good order, very bad manners. That was the first ugly thing that occurred out of this, but it was driven again, not by Dragon Well or any of these other famous uh, teas. It was driven by the Wui Mountain Tea. And that's why when you think of tea, and, and let's back up a bit, because I, in the beginning, on purpose, talked about smoky pine, because smoky pine comes from the Wui Mountains, and that was also, so it was not just cliff teas, but it was the smoky pine as well that was driving this interest in that area and this desire to get around the Chinese rules and eventually go to war, because there were two issues. One is expensive as all get out to walk it to port. And then the second thing from the British government point of view is, my God, my treasury is empty. The larder is bare. How do I fix that? Which led to, again, not only war, but it led to other bad behaviors, going in and thieving plants, and taking workers. And I don't know that those workers were voluntarily taken, but somehow workers were ending up in India because they were trying to steal the TIP. Yes. It's tea. It's very drying on the tongue right from the first sip. Love this comment. I was waiting for this. Drying on the tongue from the first sip. There is no doubt. I made it through again. We didn't serve fake or alternative cliff tea. This is real cliff tea. And you know it because early on you said minerality. You followed it up now with drying on the tongue. Definitely elements of a cliff tea. All right. So we've gotten rid of the, no, we haven't gotten rid of it. We've got it through the historical context. I really wanted to focus on the historical context a little bit today because I realized that if that's not in your head, it's hard to understand why these bigger picture things happen. Well, these bigger picture things and the Wui Ts are closely, closely connected. All right, so let's talk about naming conventions before I run out of time, good. So naming conventions are a very difficult thing to talk about because there's so much bad information out there, including in other tea sites about how names are achieved in the Wui Mountains and about the history of names. So 
I ask you this. I've had customers, including the one yesterday who came in and said, well, do you have Sui Xian? And of course we do. Do we call it Sui Xian? Of course not. So I ask you this about Sui Xian. It's prominently displayed in many sites that say that they're selling clip teas. Is Sui Xian an original varietal in the Wuyi Mountains. Oh no, I'm sorry to have to say, no, it is not. Well, where in the heck did it come from? It came from Jinyan, which is a region that's famous for white tea. And it wandered its way up there. And that's why in the white tea world, you also have Sui Xian. That's where it originated. Secondly, what about so-called Rogue Wave? Let's think about that for a minute. Did that originate in the Wii Mountains? Now, as it turns out, it did. But, but, currently, so let's back up. I'm going to give you current information. Maybe this will be helpful to you. 60 to 70% of the fields that are planted in the Wui Mountains are either roadway or Suishin. Mm, okay, so big numbers, big numbers. Did roadway start out as an important varietal in the Wui Mountains? The answer is no, it did not. And in fact, it came from what they call small clump, non-vegetal tea. Now this is gonna be a little complicated, but I'll go through it slowly so you understand. Did you just use the word vegetal? Did I just use the word vegetal? I did. Oh. So there is a type of classification in the Wui Mountains called vegetal tea. That doesn't sound good to me. That sounds like that's low class tea. Is that about how you all are picking it up? That's the wrong way to understand this. Vegetal tea refers to the original varieties natively sexually propagated within the Wui Mountains. No hybrids, no foreigners, wait, no foreign varietals. It only is the stuff that originally grew in the Wuyi Mountains. So last week, remember we did wonders. Oh, what a wonderful experience, right? And what did I say that was? Let me see if I can remember. Oh yeah, a hybrid, a hybrid of golden osmanthus and iron goddess light. So I ask you this, as delicious as it is, is it, in quotes, a vegetal tea? No, they would classify that under a flowery tea. And by flowery, what they mean here is that it's not original to the Wuyi Mountains. And they use all these two terms. Don't ask me why, because if you ask me why, will be here until this afternoon. There's so many reasons why these things arise. And I'm trying to give you the framework. And next week, if there's things that come out of this framework, you can ask me and I'll give you more background. So the vegetal teas are so-called highest teas. Rogue Way came from what they call a special clump. So what does special clump mean? So back in the past, all right, now we got to get serious. Sung Dynasty passed. So in the 1100s, 1200s, they started hybridizing teas crudely, but they were doing it in Wui Mountains. So prior to that, you had these varietals that were growing there, but very isolated. They weren't all over the mountain. 
if they were not famous, they were called Danzung. If they were famous, they were called Mingzung. Ro Gui became famous as they started planning. And why did they start planning in more places? Because it grew well, just like Sui Xian grows well there. Now, why am I going in such detail about this and what does it mean for you as a consumer? So if you go in any tea shop and they say, oh, I got Sui Xian, and they offer you one Sui Xian, how should you feel? Should you feel honored? Maybe you should feel insulted. If they offer you one rogue way, same question. This is why we don't use those names in this show. They're meaningless. They truly are meaningless except to scientists, agricultural scientists in China, because I can present to you two Sui Xians that you'll tell me you're a liar. This tastes so different from this. It can't be the same variety. I can even do it with world grace. I can present 10 of them. Hey, you're trying to trick me. 10 different flavors. Now, why would I do that? The answer is I would not do that. And that's why we drive the names according to the flavor. We're not interested in in a way, there's a history behind this, but let's not get down into the weeds because if we get down in the weeds, we will never finish today and you guys won't be happy. That's not good. So there are reasons that this occurred. And if you want to go through that next week, you can go through that. But the point being, we were very purposeful we understand where the teas come from. We understand technically what the scientists say the varietal is. All right, what else is in the names? Oh my goodness, you have numbers sometimes. Wouldn't that be convenient if, hey, I want 1132 today. Don't give me 1133, I want 1132. Well, that might be convenient if you're an accountant or you're a physicist and you like numbers or a mathematician, you love numbers, but will it tell you anything about the team? The answer is no. What are those numbers, by the way? Do people just throw those out to confuse everybody? The answer is no, they're codes. Uh-oh, we're in the spy game. What sort of codes? The Fujian Tea Institute, when they develop hybrids, they put a number to it. And so this number is cataloged in the list of numbers of hybridized teas so that people as a reference point, not consumers, but scientists can go back and look. Well, some tea purveyors have thought, hey, if I throw a number in there, which they don't understand, by the way, if you ask them, well, what's this number? Oh, they just call it that. Well, why do they call it that? Oh, they just don't, they just call it that. Don't, don't worry about that. They don't know it's a code related to the Fujian Tea Institute. Yes. So, then you could have theoretically hybrid 1132 that's gonna have multiple tastes because it only refers to the hybrid but you could then have four different flavors of 1132 because it's all about the processing, right? Yeah, you, not only the pro, you've categorized, but left one thing out, the micro terrar as well. So perfect description, just throw in there that micro terrar because the terrars, and we haven't talked about this a whole lot. And again, I don't want to get way down in the, the weeds, but we have talked about position on the mountain. So we know that position on the mountain makes a difference, right? And each of these valleys, they're in different places and the airflow is very different. The sunlight's very different. It's, it's a different terrain. The soil, the, the range of pH in the soils uh, is different. So the, 
the answer to your question is yes, just throw in the micro throw. And the pick, right? And the pick, uh, that's, that's true too. Although in the Wii Mountains, because the farmers have essentially agreed, especially in the premium area, that we're only gonna have one, one pick, boys, and that's it. Uh, that the pick is always going to be a spring pick. Now, when in the spring it's picked, you're right. Some is earlier spring, some is late, and those things all make a difference. Uh, tasting observations from participants, a couple more. Um, somebody else confirmed smooth swallow after that burst of dryness on the lips and the tip of the tongue. Um, Somebody's getting a warming, calming effect on her. And another participant is ending with a sort of sweet powdered sandstone kind of, I'm not oh, sure, Joe, whether that's a taste or I like scent, that. sweet no, powdered sandstone. I get it. I get it. Sweet sandstone. The reason I love that is because here's what I'm hearing. Ah, sweetness mixed with minerality. Love what you just said. The warmth. Uh, the feeling of calming, the feeling of comfort. I definitely get warmth and I get it all throughout my uh, chest. Um, I get, uh, my feet are warm. I mean, this truly warms my extremities. What was the middle comment? In uh, somebody mentioned the uh, smooth swallow. Uh, smooth swallow, that's the one I missed. The smooth swallow, what a great comment because you know, if you're drinking a big bodied something, whether it's a pomegranate juice or a Cabernet, it's, and, and it's very smooth, it's the sense of that huge mouth feel, but it just goes down so easily and so smoothly. And I get that in your, your comment. And this is how I feel about this tea. Another taster says she's finding that that cocoa taste also comes as an aftertaste. Oh, love this. So a cocoa taste as an aftertaste. Yes, so we're hearing cocoa in the smell, we're hearing it in the wet leaves, we're hearing it in the initial taste, and we're hearing the aftertaste. Perhaps we actually went and got some really fine cocoa and mixed it with that would be false. We don't do stuff like that. But I get it. It's there. Yes. Uh, uh, Usman's also getting some floral scents in her second cup. Okay. So remembering that I accept and encourage um, fruit and floral because all of us, we all sense things and apply pictures a little differently. I accept that because we've already accepted the fruit. So yes, there is a floral. And for those of you who take a second cup who said fruit the first time around, I would bet you'd say a stronger fruit the second time around. So great catch on that. All right. So I'm gonna finish up here because I'm running late. What are the main things things is criteria that people use in naming teas in the Wui Mountains and what's been the history of this? This sounds like a 20 minute question. It's not. I'm going to get it done in six. So in the Tang Dynasty, there were Tang and Sung Dynasty, there were scads of names for the Wui tea. Scads. In the early 1900s, a scientist went through to try and determine how many true different varietals there were. And he came up with 70 is what he thought. So somewhere between 70 and probably 200 different varieties. How many of those plants are there? In some cases, there's just one or two plants. And that's why you don't see it on the market. In some cases, things are named a certain way in the Wui Mountains because the producer or the farmer names it that way because 
they feel it represents something different. But again, remembering what I just said about Michael Terrars and the, the whole sense of naming conventions. Yeah, I get it that these names have stuck, but it's just not really useful for you as a consumer. There's basically eight or nine things that they use to name. So what's the environment that the tea grows in? What's the shape of the tea plant it grows in? What is the shape of the leaf? What is the shape of the sprout? So each of these things can stimulate, each of these items can stimulate a name. What is uh, the uh, position within the mountain where it's at? What is the myth that surrounds the tea? Because many of them have myths, stories, legends associated with the tea. So there's a whole bunch of things that go into the naming conventions in China. And it's so hard for us from the outside to understand that. And it hints the reason that we've done this this different way. And there's plenty of good logic from a consumer standpoint for you to use these names. All right, I can talk on this subject for a long, long time. And the tea master is giving me tea master eyes, which indicate that my time of talking should be over. So what are your responsibilities this week? Your main responsibility is to stay healthy. Everybody in the world has to dodge those COVID viruses when you're out there, the flu viruses, and the things that the little uh, children are carrying, RSV or RS, whatever it is. There's a lot of stuff going on out there. Let's be careful this week. That's the main message. Secondly, next week, what are we going to cover? We're going to cover thousand energies. And yes, I know I promised you big words in science this week. Truly next week. I'll get extra big words and extra science. In the meantime, you all have a wonderful week. Thank you for all your great commentary. You guys are the best. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.